Hi, Kevin Ledoux, the Pragmatic Luther. I'm back again today with uh, a jig that I want to show you. This might not be what you would call a pragmatic solution. Might be a little bit on the exotic side, but I thought I'd show it to you anyway. Some of you might uh, want to take on the challenge of putting one of these together. Um, what I'm doing is I'm creating this sweep of a neck heel here and here. And I'm doing right now, I'm doing three guitars that all of those uh, heels will be identical when they're, when they're done. Now, quite often, I will lay that heel out and I'll use a template like this. I have, I don't know, a dozen of these or so, because a lot of times I'll lay out one of these templates for each individual guitar, depending on what it is exactly. Uh, you know, there are a lot of factors that affect that curve, you know, the depths of that heel in the first place and, you know, aesthetic concerns and stuff like that. But today I thought, you know, I'm going to sweep three of these and I could lay them out with a template and cut them out with a coping saw. It really doesn't take very long to do it. But I thought, you know, I'm going to revisit some of my jigs. Uh, this is a heel sweeping jig that I use with my students when I taught a guitar making class in a local high school. And this made it a little easier for them. Um, as you may have guessed, uh, kids in high school are not always really good with the coping saw. So this gave them a leg up on the deal. Uh, the jig itself, I will admit, is a little bit difficult to make. It's, it takes some kind of hair raising, sanding and slicing here and there. This is built on a piece of, oh, approximately one inch by five inch, I'll say. I use quarter sawn maple. The species doesn't matter as long as it's good, hard, dense wood. And I wanted it to be quartered because I just wanted the dimensional stability out of it. Before I cut any of this shape that you see here, I set up my router and I routed this slot, which matches uh, the tenon in my neck heel. This is always three quarter. And all of these are, they're rigged up together, all done with the same three quarter inch bits and so on, so that you can, you can match all of this. So I routed this to accommodate the heel. And then I put a cap over the end of it uh, to give me a stopping point for the neck. The real tough part was to cut these areas out with a bandsaw because this side and this side, they've got to be identical. So I needed to make a very nice heavy paper or cardboard template that I could lay this out with a very fine pencil, you know, a half millimeter lead or even with a knife. And then it was a matter of cutting and going to the spindle sander and just very carefully refining those. Now, of course, down here, you want this to be balanced, but if it was off by a hundredth of an inch, you'd never see it. But up here is a different matter. At this point, this is where the 14th fret of the neck sits. You see this sits in here like so. And this is the 14th fret right here. So this, this width must match exactly or exceed slightly. And exceed slightly is fair enough. Uh, sometimes it's nice to have a jig that gets you right into the neighborhood, but doesn't try uh, to be absolutely, absolutely precise. At other times, you need jigs to be absolute. But at any rate, uh, this was a little difficult to make, but you can do it. A little bit of patience, sanding, scraping. If you don't have a spindle sander, you can make that work. And then I put a toggle clamp on it to grab onto that heel. So I'm going to go over to the shaper and just give you a quick rundown on how this works. The idea is that the tenon uh, on the neck sits right in there, like so. And the toggle clamp holds it down. So we'll go over to the shaper and do a quick run on how this thing works. Now, if you've watched any of my videos before, you've probably seen me operate this shaper. Uh, but if you haven't, I'll just explain. I have a zero clearance cutter. This is just a straight cutter, one inch tall. 
uh, running on a three quarter inch spindle. And this is a bearing that's exactly the same diameter. So whatever touches the bearing, the shaper cuts exactly the sh same shape that the bearing reads. It's that easy. It, you know, it's just like a, a bearing bit on a router. It's just in a little bit different direction, upside down. So I'm quickly just gonna sweep this heel um, and then we'll talk about the results when we're done. For those of you that might not be used to uh, router tables or shapers too much, um, take note that when I did this side of the heel, I was very gingerly about this. And that's because I'm sweeping upward on the grain and I'm really working against it. Um, this is not in my favor. So I tried to make sure I got light cuts uh, so that I didn't tear this up too much. When I hit the other side, I'm working down on the grain and it's quite trustworthy. So you may have noticed that I just cut right into that and I swept it right out. Um, the grain allowed me to do that. So here's my neck heel, all swept. And I've got the correct dimensions here at the 14th fret. I've got symmetry here, so I'm good to go. I will, at the appropriate time after my inserts are set, I will carve this heel, but I'll only carve it up to about this point where the heel transitions right into the next shaft. And I do that because the fingerboard is not in my way when I do that. It just makes it a lot easier to do. After that heel is carved and refined reasonably, I'll put a heel cap on it and then refine it absolutely, sand it all out and we'll be ready to go. Then when the fingerboard is glued down, the fingerboard is used as a guide to carve the rest of the neck and its transition between the heel area and the rest of the neck shaft. For me, that works really well. So at this point, I have this thing at a point where now I can make sure that I've got what I want. I can check my neck angle. I can check whether or not the neck is correctly oriented with a center line and of course, I can check the fit of the neck joint if I want and do a little bit of refining or whatever adjustments might be needed. And it's nice to do that without that fingerboard on there because if you've got to do any work on the inside of that heel, especially up here, you know, maybe if you have to bring that neck ever so slightly forward, when that fingerboard is on there, it's just much harder to do. So there's a little bit of an advantage to some pre-fitting at this point. So, I guess maybe this is a little bit exotic, uh, but the point of jigs, more often than not, is to help you pre-excuse me predetermine a desired outcome. That's what a jig is for. That's what it does. It guides a tool. It holds the work and it guides a tool in its action, and it is intended to produce a predetermined result every time the same way every time you use it. That's why I had students using it because they didn't have the skill to meet those points and get that symmetry with a coping saw and then even file into it and perfect that. That was a little bit out of their reach. So if all of this is well within your reach, you might look at this and say, oh my God, this is really overkill. And for you, it might be. But if it's something that interests you, and if you do a lot of neck heels uh, that are all the same width at this point, then it might be something you can use. So at any rate, happy guitar building. And thanks a lot for watching my video. Uh, you're welcome to subscribe if you're in the mood to. I sure would appreciate it if you do. Thanks uh, again for watching. Kevin Ledoux, The Pragmatic Luther, once again, the largest manufacturer of guitars in the entire town of Triangle, New York.